This is 20 essential tips for you in Hunt Showdown 1896. Now this is mainly geared towards beginners, but it does have a few pro tips scattered within this video. I'm not linking it in the timestamps, so the ones who watch through the end are going to learn those. Also, if you want to see me live, I'm over on Twitch at Naora TV, Friday 9 p.m. to 3 a.m. EST, as well as Saturday and Sunday 3 p.m. to midnight or later, depending on how the stream goes. Now, I will be providing more of this type of content going forward here on YouTube. So if you guys like the sound of that, leave a like and a comment as well as subscribe for more. Now, let's get into the video. In the settings, you can go to your HUD and then go all the way down. And then there is highlight interactable objects. This can be set to none, all or exclude windows and doors. If it's set to all, there will be a noticeable highlight around all consumables, bells that you can ring, melee world items, lanterns, windows, doors, air traps, guns and saddles and saddlebags, ammo boxes, lanterns on the wall. Essentially anything you can interact with will highlight. And this is very annoying for some people. Now, if you turn it to exclude windows and doors, well, that's pretty self-explanatory, but everything else will be highlighted. Your teammates are also highlighted, so a lot of people prefer to put this on exclude windows and doors, because if you go to none, then it will not highlight your teammates. I personally keep this on none. A lot of people don't know that if you are bleeding, the time it takes for you to just stop your bleed normally by pressing the interact button is a lot longer than the time it would take to just use a med kit. And on top of using the med kit to stop your bleeds, it heals you. Vitalities will not stop your bleed during the use of that vitality. Once it's done, it will heal you and stop the bleed. But if you're very low on HP and your bleed is ticking, it might not be the best to use a vitality. You wanna mainly opt for using your med kit if your HP is ticking while you're bleeding and you're very low on HP so it will stop the bleed and heal you. But if you have a decent chunk of HP that is bleeding and ticking down, you should still be able to use a vitality shot in time before you die. Your weak vitalities, which only come in at 20 hunt dollars, are way quicker than the regular fatality shots now they only do 75 hp which is half of your health depending on how damaged you are this is very solid for the price here you can see the use times between the weak vitality and the regular vitality some bolt action rifles and a few other guns will make you lose a round if you do a partial reload a partial reload is essentially when you don't have your magazine filled up and you would like to. So you press reload and without bullet grubber, you would lose a round. A perfect round will just fly out of your gun and you won't be able to pick it up. With bullet grubber, there's a nice animation. He'll catch the bullet and then put it back in, which is keeping you from losing that bullet, which is why the, the trait is solid. But if you don't have bullet grubber, after you fire a shot, if you press reload quickly before he cycles the next round, you will eject the casing that was just fired and insert the new one meaning you saved yourself a bullet and the bullet that was thrown on the ground had already been expended. Now, yes, this means you have to fire a shot and then do it, but if you hold left click after your shot, the animation will not continue, so you don't have to worry about being quick. You can hold left click, so a hunter will just hold the rifle as if they were gonna hip fire, and then you can reload and easily top off. This does not work for all of these guns in the game but bullet grubber does work for these guns so this is a way to save your ammo without using bullet grubber and all in all it's a pretty smart thing to use if you're using these guns so one of the pro tips is going to be finding out if a specific trait works for the gun you want to use so if you're navigating the traits and you're like what trait is going to work with what gun you can go into the weapon selection screen and then go to the top left at this eyeglass Click it and make sure it's highlighted. If it is not highlighted, it will not be an active filter. But type in the trait that you are bringing into question and it will filter all of the guns that work with that trait. This is a pretty fast one and something that not a lot of people know about, but we have more of these pro tips in the video. Just keep watching. Also, if you wanna see more of this type of content, leave a like, comment, and subscribe for more. Let's continue. This is a very big tip that a lot of people don't 
use. Essentially, your base keybind for jumping and vaulting is the same thing with spacebar. Meaning if you are trying to get a little bit of height and jump to see over something, or just jump in general close to a ledge, you will instead vault and potentially fall to your death. I and a lot of other people split this to be two separate buttons, and it seems like it'll be a very rough change, but I'm telling you from experience, change it. It's not that terrible over time. You will get used to it, and it'll definitely make you a better player and save you in a few circumstances. You go into settings, go to controls, and then mouse and keyboard bindings. You will see that there's an option for jump and vault on the same keybind, but if you go below, there's two separate ones. I and a lot of other people use space for jump and then V for vault. Like I said, it's something to get used to, but it is definitely a move in the right direction if you want to be the best player you can be. Aim helper essentially has these white dots leading into a diamond, which essentially is exactly where your throwable will land. It does not show where it will fall, so this is just where it will hit, and then it will fall wherever it goes. Also, it will glow red if you are within its danger zone, meaning you will take damage from it. Not necessarily that you will die, but you will take damage from this if it is red. The tip here though is that the detonation can completely be controlled by you. You can pick wherever this detonation will go off. So if you don't want it to hit the wall and then have the choke fall on the ground, you can hold this closer till the detonation goes off and as the timer goes down, your diamond or quote unquote where this detonation will happen will decrease in the distance from you like this. This isn't the best place to explain this, but let's say somebody was shooting out this window and killed my teammate, which is going to be represented in this lantern. Now, if I wanted to revive him, it would be very hard for the person who just shot at him to not be able to knock him right back down because he has such a clear line of sight. So if I want to, I can take my choke bomb and purposely explode it right in front of the window. Now, yes, I could just throw it in there, but my angle might not always be amazing for me to chuck it into the window without him shooting at me. Just in general, if I wanted to obstruct his vision and then maybe go for a necromancer or a straight revive on my teammate so I can have a better chance of getting him up. Here's another example of maybe a different spot, the lantern being my teammate. Maybe they died here and somebody else was down a little lower on the wall who killed him. And I just like to somewhat cover my teammate if I go for a necro or even a hard revive. I'm going to prime my choke bomb and wait until the diamond gets a little bit in front of him in the air. And that is where I'm going to try and make it detonate. The revive should be a lot easier to accomplish, especially if you're using Necromancer. Mainly a performance tip for your frame rates or your performance issues in general. In your graphics settings, your super resolution, if you have a Nvidia card, you're going to want to use Nvidia DLSS. And if you have a AMD card, you're going to want to use AMD FSR. This is supposed to make your performance the best for that specific card. But the big thing is if you're having really bad FPS issues and you have everything else you think in line, mess with your video RAM usage target. It goes 70, 80, or 90%. But I have had many people come into my streams and ask me why they're having FPS issues in game. And with the good help of a few friends in my community, some have actually had this issue completely resolved by just turning down the VRAM usage. This is essentially the percentage of the VRAM that you are okay with using on your graphics card. If you would like to have a ranged weapon, but also feel like you need the iron sights of a weapon, to be effective with it. And I know this might not sound practical, but this actually is a viable option if you get used to it. The variant is called the Aperture, and it is on a few guns in the game, all of these ones to be exact. Essentially with this variant, you can use your base iron sights on that gun, and with the base keybind of X, you can toggle the Aperture up or down. With it up, it makes for a budget scope, but it does zoom in a good amount and lets you get consistent headshots if the targets are not moving much at a distance. I'm not saying that this is better than scopes. I'm just saying this is a viable alternative to scopes if you would also like to have your iron sights of that same gun. It's very underrated in my opinion and a lot of people disregard the apertures in general. And something to note, the Nitro Express aperture cannot be toggled. It would be a little overpowered if it could, 
but yes every other gun that has one can toggle up or down these alert mines actually got a huge buff burning off a whole 25 chunk just for you hitting them now the tip is to mainly use them but also if you don't want to lose a 25 chunk just from stepping on these the salve skin trait will keep you from doing that as long as you're quick to stop the burn after you hit it so if you take salve skin you can step on these and reliably extinguish yourself before losing that 25 chunk death traps and hunt showdown don't actually always lead to your death now i'm not talking about somebody having an antidote because obviously that would negate the poison but if you put a concertina tripwire a poison tripwire and a bear trap all on a vault over position that somebody can vault on or walk on to it usually leaves no wiggle room for the person to survive if they don't have an antidote but the truth is that you can actually survive these if you are continuously moving when you vault into the position if you stop at all you will die but if your reaction is quick and you continue moving in the direction that you are, you will survive. With barely any health, that is, but you survive. Very quickly, this next pro tip is if you die in water, you cannot be burned unless somebody has a liquid fire bomb. So I am definitely not telling you 100%. This is not me telling you to go potentially die potentially in water or stand in water when a whole trio is pushing you and you think your odds are very limited. I'm not telling you, I'm definitely, no, no, definitely not telling you to stand in water, but do with this information what you will. On to the next. I've had many beginners ask me in my stream, what is a good weapon to pair with a sniper or a scoped weapon in general? And the truth is something that's good at close quarters. I'm not talking about any of the medium sized weapons that you could put into your loadout with quartermaster with the trait quartermaster. So I'm mainly talking about pistols, but in this situation, let's say you're fighting somebody at a distance and then somebody pulls up on you, but it's time the differences between these two types of pistols that I'm showing in this example and how quick you can get off six shots with each pistol, which is ammo that might need to be expended very fast. If a whole team is pulling up on you close quarters. So as you can see, the first pistol, which is the new army, is way quicker at getting its ammo out versus the packs. Now their bullet sizes are different, but one is a double action pistol and the other is a single action pistol. The main point of this tip is that if you are using a long ranged primary with a scope, you need something that is going to complement that up close. You do not ideally want a secondary that is a slow firing pistol. So my answer to anybody outside of the medium slot weapons like i said is always going to be a double action pistol or a semi-automatic pistol now the double actions shoot faster and don't require the hunter's thumb to pull back the firing pin after each shot meaning it's very similar to a semi-automatic as you just pull the trigger and a shot comes out but for the single action pistols it takes a little longer between shots so to wrap a bow on it if you have a scope on your primary and you only have a single slot item as your secondary use any of these pistols and thank me later now here's one of the pro tips now this isn't always going to be practical but it can be viable at a long distance with a sniper you're going to aim at a specific point so you can test how the bullet drop is going to be after you pull the trigger and look back you can see at this spot where your bullet landed and then try to vaguely remember on the scopes line where that shot landed like right here and then line that exact spot up to your enemy's head, like this. Like I said, this is not always going to be practical. It's not always going to be easy. It's actually probably going to be difficult, but at a very long range distance, this is viable. Choke bombs actually extinguish poison clouds. Very good to know, just choke any poison that's close especially if you have a dead teammate that died in poison 
and you don't know if your revive will make them stand up close to it, just choke the poison and get it done with. Some people don't know that the choke bomb actually detonates a bigger cloud than what it leaves behind. So at the beginning, the cloud will be a lot bigger and then it'll shrink up into its final cloud that it leaves after you threw it. But what's good about this is you can throw it at a decent distance to the side of whatever you were trying to extinguish and that initial burst will cover that area and extinguish the fires, but then shrink back in. So let's say you are trying to extinguish a teammate that is burning, but you don't want him to stand up in a choke cloud. Throw it five meters exactly to the side, which I know isn't always easy to calculate, but I'm just saying that is the distance. It'll detonate and its initial choke cloud will spread out over that area, and then it'll shrink back in and your teammate can be rezzed and not stand in a cloud of chokes. The spyglass in this update, if you use it in game and ping during the match, it'll give you a distance marker, which is very useful to know if the shot you are going to take with your rifle or your gun in general is going to be outside its drop range, which if it is means you're going to start having to aim up and compensating for the bullet drop. Essentially, if you take this in and use it, you can spot the distance. If it's outside of your drop range, then you know to start aiming above the head. All of these guns are affected by the trait Iron Eye, and that essentially just lets your hunter stay aiming down sight without moving it too much after each shot. As you can see here, without it, on this regular Ranger rifle, when he goes to cycle the next shot with the lever, the sights do not stay in line. With Iron Eye, your sights stay right where they were, so it's easier to make a follow-up shot. Now, not all of the rifles have this exact animation. Some of them do pull the gun away, but they usually keep it in line, so it's a lot easier to make the follow-up shots. But it also slightly increases your rate of fire with it. Here's the time to five shots with the Ranger rifle and no Iron Eye, and the time to five shots with the Ranger rifle and Iron Eye equipped. If you're using the hunting bow and want to cancel your shot, but you already have the arrow drawn and ready for fire, if you press the reload button R, your hunter will disengage the arrow like this. Lanterns can kill horses silently. If you press X on the lantern, it'll turn the flame off and then you can throw it with the aim helper on the horse's head and it'll kill him silently. In this example, I already have all three of the clues for each of the bosses, but each clue that you pick up is a guaranteed $50 that you get to survive with even if you die. It is not counted in your total hunt dollar and blood bond pool that you can find around the map. With those, if you die, you lose it. But with these clues, they pay you out regardless. So if you spawn on the boss, make sure to get the clue first because it will pay you out for three clues, meaning you get 150 hunt dollars just for picking up that single clue. Another cool tip, if you're playing in teams and your teammates are a little further from your dead body if you died to a team and they want to know if there's still people on you, all you have to do is go back to your main screen when you first died and listen. I know this might sound stupid, but you're going to most likely spectate your teammates right after you die, and then you might be missing out on important information like if they're on top of your body. Periodically check back on your body if it's a long stalemate and your teammates need to know if there's still no chance to reviving you. If you're tired of hearing people VoIP in game, you can completely turn it off or just have it set to only be on when you're alive. So when you die, you don't hear them taunt you and say stupid things. If you made it to the end, I sincerely appreciate you. And if you wanna learn everything you need to know about killing every boss in the game, then click right here. Until then, I'll see you in the Gulch.